right, thank you. Um, so this, uh, this talk is going to survey a, a couple of recent papers, um, a lot of it joint work with Shuchi Chala and uh, Dennis Nikopelov, and also with my uh, PhD student, Sam Tigart. Um, just to, as a public service announcement, so we're, we're diverging in our day of mechanism design from uh, mechanisms where we're going to run one mechanism that's worth billions of dollars to situations where we're going to run billions of mechanisms worth a dollar. Okay, so that, that change is going to um, bring in very different kinds of techniques and methods for thinking about mechanisms, um, which uh, are going to be, therefore, very different. <laughs> okay, so I want to introduce you to the uh, protagonist of, of this talk, um, and that is a first price position auction. So many of you are probably familiar with this uh, concept. You have n positions. These positions are uh, ordered in uh, decreasing weight. Uh, so the first position is the best. The last position is the worst. Um, and you can think of the positions having corresponding allocation probabilities. So a, a bidder assigned to position i gets allocated with probability wi. Okay. I'll have n bidders. The values are drawn iid from a continuous distribution f. And I'm going to be studying uh, what happens when bids are in Bayes-Nash equilibrium. Uh, we'll typically look at position auctions where bidders are assigned to positions uh, by order of bids. So all I care about is the order of bids in a position auction. I don't care about the actual magnitudes of bids. Okay? Uh, bidders will pay their bid when they're allocated. So bidder allocated position I is going to get a, uh, uh, re receive service with probability WI, and they're going to pay their bid with also with probability WI. Okay, so here's how I like to draw a picture of this. I have my positions, and I have these Ws, and this is the picture I tend to like to draw in my head. So there it is. Too many W2s. <laughs> <laughs> So the results that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, are the following, uh, coming from the three papers I had in the, uh, on the cover slide uh, in the exact same order. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a result showing you that the equilibrium in this IID position auction is uh, efficient, symmetric, and unique. There's only one equilibrium in this auction. Okay, I'm going to talk about how you can do statistical inference in this auction, which may be useful if you want to optimize over all uh, feasible allocations you can allocate, uh, given some constraints of the weights that you have uh, to, say, optimize, say, revenue. Um, you can do that. Uh, we're going to actually be looking at optimizing welfare, and you'll see why we need to know the statistics uh, as, as we uh, get into the talk. Um, so uh, statistical inference is actually easy in, for these kinds of auctions. And then the last uh, result uh, that I'm going to talk about is that let's suppose you didn't have an environment that was a position auction, but you had any old single dimensional environment with linear utilities and independent values, which is sort of the canonical model of auction theory. If you have any of these environments, I can reduce that environment to ID position auctions. And so in some sense, if you understand ID position auctions, you can understand everything. Uh, with these caveats. Okay, so um, with that said, uh, you know this model of auction theory, this auction in particular, is a, a fundamental auction that we we understand that we understand very well. We should understand very well, and we actually do. And so I'm going to go over that in the talk. Okay, good. So I'm going to start out with um, some motivation for why I care about. Uh, in particular, the first price variant of position auctions and the first price variant of any auction. Um, and that is the following. Um, so uh, auction theorists like to start doing auction theory with the revelation principle, which says that if you have uh, an auction with a good equilibrium, there's always an auction, that, uh, a truthful auction, that has the same quality equilibrium. And so you might as well, if you're doing auction theory, first restrict attention from all possible auctions to only the ones with truth-telling as equilibrium, uh, and then study those instead. 
Okay, so um, that's the revelation principle. Um, there are some issues with this. Um, we actually saw some in the last section where the revelation principle didn't apply, and there's some more. Um, so if you look in real life at these mechanisms, and again, I'm talking about the kinds of mechanisms where I have billions of them, each worth a dollar, those mechanisms are rarely truthful mechanisms. Okay, so the fact that we first restricted the revelation principle means we're actually missing the mechanisms we actually care about. Okay, but good, the revelation principle says if I find a truthful one, there should be uh, the one I actually want in that class too, hopefully. Um, and actually undoing the revelation principle, going to say the first price implementation of whatever mechanism I want, uh, tends to give you ridiculous seeming mechanisms. We'll do this exercise in the next slide. Okay, um, so a conclusion from this high-level uh, discussion is that we maybe need a theory for understanding and designing non-revelation mechanisms themselves from the beginning. Okay, and so I'm going to be talking about those kinds of ideas uh, today. Okay, so here's the, um, the motivating problem I want you to have in your head throughout the entirety of this talk. Okay, so suppose I really want to solve this problem. I don't want to solve the IID position auction problem. I want to solve single-minded combinatorial auctions in a Bayesian environment. Okay, so I have M items, N bidders. Bidder I has value VI for a known bundle SI of goods and no value for anything else. This is the standard single-minded uh, combinatorial auction model. Um, but I'm going to study in a Bayesian setting, so players value VI is drawn independently from distribution FI, and this can be different across the different players, so it's not IID like the Pishin auction was on the previous slide. Okay, so I would like to have a combinatorial auction with first price payment uh, and a good Bayes Nash equilibrium. That's my goal. Okay, um, why do I want this? Well, maybe because of some rules or something I'm required to having a first price auction, or um, maybe because of some other interactions, the second price auction isn't truthful, the VCG auction is not truthful anyway, so I don't care about it. And so this first price auction has uh, maybe better strategic properties. So let's talk about that. Um, so, uh, before I do, I'm just gonna use notation capital X, the same way it was used in previous talks for the set of feasible outcomes. So um, Paul, Ilya, and uh, everyone was talking about this. Um, so this is just an indicator back here telling me who's served, who's not served. Um, and so if two players are served, it better be their sets of items that they wanted don't intersect. Okay, you can think single-minded combinatorial auctions throughout the talk. I'll be talking in general about any old X you want. Yeah. Private or? No, they're public. Okay, so um, the first thing I promised you I would do is I'd talk about uh, undoing the revelation principle. So um, if I want to design this auction, I start out in my theory land taking the revelation principle, designing the truthful auction, that's BCG. Okay? Now, I want to undo that, and the way you undo that is to use uh, revenue equivalents with a payment identity. Um, we'll talk about that more uh, later, uh, but the, this, is, this is how it goes. Okay, so um, let's just def look at, if we were in VCG, what a player would pay an expectation conditioned on them winning. Okay, and so for player i, with any value vi they, they might have, I can write the function si of vi is the expected payment they make conditioned on winning with value vi. Okay, now what am I gonna do in my auction? I get some bids. I'm gonna then sort of guess that these, these, these si's were strategies and invert the strategy from bids to get values. Okay? Well, now that I have values, I can use the VCG outcome by just finding the feasible set that maximizes the total surplus of values. Okay, and so then I output that, and I'm gonna charge winners their bids. And here's the, the, the sort of obvious when you think about it. Well, if I run this mechanism, what is the Bayes-Nash equilibrium? Well, what is a Bayes-Nash equilibrium? One of them is to use the players to use strategy profile S. Okay? 
And that's because it's the strategy profile that gets them exactly their VCG equivalent payoff, and it has exactly the same allocation rule as VCG, and it has the same expected payments as VCG, and therefore the Bayes-Nash calculation tells you that's an equilibrium. Okay, so um, is this a good mechanism? Do we like this mechanism? So this is really complicated because these strategy functions, like, you know, and your mechanism has to know these, and then the bidders have to believe that you correctly calculate these, and it's just ridiculous, right? So it's complex, highly dependent on the prior. You need the prior to calculate these SIs, then you need to invert them. So you better need your inversion to not have, like, you know, large jumps and stuff because things are uh, uh, not changing very much. Um, and it's huge, uh, there could be more equilibria. Um, if you did this noisily with algorithms that weren't quite right, as, as uh, Paul and others were saying, this is just gonna be a mess. Okay, here's another approach. Um, this approach is um, to follow the perspective of the price of anarchy uh, literature. Um, that is, uh, let's look at simple mechanisms uh, that are in this space uh, that, uh, I'm gonna plug my battery in. Look at simple mechanisms in this space uh, and prove that these simple natural mechanisms have good equilibria. This is not really mechanism design, it's mechanism analysis, and you have to get lucky that you uh, identified some simple things that happen to have good equilibria in the first place. Okay, um, so here is the simplest possible thing you might think of for a single-minded common control auction. I'm gonna ask for bids. I'm gonna output the set of things that maximizes the weighted sum of bid, uh, the weighted allocation by bid, right? So maximize the sum of bids of players you serve. Okay, and charge the winners their bids, it's first price. Okay, and fortunately the price of anarchy here is N, meaning uh, there are example combinatorial auctions and distributions where there are equilibria, Bayes-Nash equilibria, where the welfare in equilibria is a factor of N from the uh, welfare of the uh, optimal outcome. Okay, so here's another mechanism you could run. Uh, and that is, well, instead of using the optimal algorithm to optimize your sum of bids, use a greedy algorithm. Uh, it turns out greedy algorithms have much better strategic properties, and so this equilibrium is gonna be much uh, better. Um, and uh, you can show that the equilibrium actually improves to, to root M rather than N. Actually, I probably should have said M there, or M is the number of items. Um, so it goes from M to root M, which is much better. Okay, but look, a root M approximation actually is still really terrible. Okay, so we still don't have simple mechanisms for this setting that are actually any good. Okay, so here is again our protagonist, the first price position auction. Um, unlike the setting of single-minded combinatorial auctions with asymmetric players, the equilibrium is always efficient, symmetric, and unique, so it's always optimal, so this is a, a great situation. Um, the, uh, actually finding equilibria is also really easy in this auction. Um, and so what I'm gonna be showing you in this talk is that uh, this auction has great properties and furthermore, I can use this auction to solve my previous single-minded common control auction problem and get a arbitrary close to optimal solution. Okay, so it's gonna be an approximate reduction I'm gonna give you, but it's gonna be like a p-test. It's gonna give you, for any epsilon you want, it'll give you a one minus epsilon approximation. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna do this backwards because I think um, the real motivation for me telling you all this stuff is this reduction, the fact that um, these position auction is just fundamentally important. So after I show you this reduction, I'm then going to show you all these nice properties, which hopefully you're then more, much more motivated to see. Okay, so the reduction. 
Okay, so here's the environment I'm talking about. I have n agents. Uh, they have independent values, not identically drawn, just independent. Uh, there's some feasibility constraint x. You're trying to optimize social surplus, say. Actually, all the methods I'm going to talk about today also apply to revenue, but I'm just going to focus on social surplus because it's easier. So here's the approach of the reduction. Okay, so let's consider each bidder. And in the auction, they're going to bid some BI. Okay, which means given that their value comes from the distribution, there was some function, strategy function mapping their values to bids, and so there's actually some distribution of bids that are coming from that bidder that other bidders face. Okay, let's suppose that I had T minus one other samples from this bidder's bid distribution. Okay, let's suppose I had those. Okay, then I could take this bid and calculate this bidder's rank amongst those other bids from the same distribution. Meaning, where is this bidder in the order of all these bids? Okay? And then I'm going to, given all the ranks of all the bidders who actually show up, okay, and these are ranks of bidders amongst their own distribution, not ranks of these bidders amongst, I don't care about, this is for bidder I only I do this. Now I have bidder I's rank, so suppose he's fifth. Okay, and suppose bidder J is second. Okay, so given all these rank information, I then allocate to the end bidders optimally given the rank information only. Is there a question? Yeah. Once you've computed the ranks, do you throw the G distributions away, or are you taking account of the Gs when you're optimally? No, everything's thrown away. Only the ranks. So rank information only. What does it mean? Sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Let's suppose I only tell you the ranks of some bidders, but you know their values are drawn from a distribution F, Fi for each bidder. Okay, so given I had T samples from a bid distribution, and I told you this bidder is fifth, you could uh, update your prior on their value to get a posterior distribution on what their value is given that they're fifth. Okay, and given your update, Actually, since you only use the ranks, all you care about is the expected order statistic of this bidder. So if he's fifth, you care about the fifth order statistic of your distribution. Okay, so what do you do given only the rank information? You, ca if you calculate the expected order statistic of that bidder and you then optimally allocate given the order statistics. Given the expected order statistics. So given the values they have an expectation from your posterior, you allocate. Okay. So to do this, we need to know GI, which is a... No, to do this, you need to know FI. I don't care about the order statistic of bids. I care about the order statistic of values. I want to optimize value a bidder. But I mean, to, to even come up with the rank. To do step two, we only need to know FI. But to I'm, I'm about to fill in this blank space here. See all the space I have to fill in? Okay. <laughs> Good. So we're in the environment where we're running millions and billions of mechanisms that are worth a dollar. Which means, where did I have all these distributions and stuff? Well, probably I ran the mechanism before. Okay? So imagine for player I, there's actually a population of players, and I actually ran this mechanism before on this, this kind of player, and before I had other random draws. So I'm just gonna say, let's just use T minus one previous runs of the mechanism to get these values. Okay? So now I don't need to know G, I just look back at my data. Okay? For the last T minus one times I ran this and use those bids. And so each player, I say, well, how did you compare versus the last T minus one bids I have of people in your role in the mechanism? Sorry, when you say expected order statistics, how would you, how would that, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the parenthetical remark. Okay, so an order statistic uh, is a random variable and its expectation is the expected one. Right, so the fifth order stick is a random variable. Right, I just care about its expected value because I, I mean, at the end of the day, get the expected value if I allocate to that guy. So I don't care what its exact value is. You need to have some information about the distribution. I need to know some information about the distribution. So this is not, so when I, before I put up this single line and common control auction that inverted this strategy function, right? So it had to have some information too. I claim I have to have a lot less information to do this. We'll actually make that really formal what information we need. Yeah. And the story here is we have sequential mechanisms and the participants are all different over time, so the participants today are all different from yesterday. I'm going to make the story very concrete in the next slide. 
Okay, so, but yes, what you think is going to happen is going to happen. Yeah. Can you say something about why this assumption is importantly different from just knowing G? If you're doing this billions of times, like why not just say you know G if you're willing to say you, know, you can line up these previous bids as being from the same type of bidder? That's fine. Um, however, I think working with an empirical distribution is better than working with an exact distribution because then I'm worried about how correctly I've estimated this. And all I'm saying is actually just use the T minus one samples that you have. Okay, so yeah, you could, I mean, I'm using a weaker assumption and it's sufficient. Okay, so what does player I think about this mechanism? Well, they're going to get one of these ranks because they're basically competing with other, the T minus one other copies of themselves to get ranked, right? And so what does my mechanism do to a player ranked five, player I if they're ranked five? It allocates to them with some probability, independently of their bid. Okay, so if you're ranked five, you get some allocation probability for player I. Should I be thinking of this I as being the same guy in each of these iterations or different people in the same role? Think of it never being the same guy. Different people in the same role. Yeah. And you don't observe history, right? You don't know what the previous people did. Uh, that's right. The players don't observe history. There's new players drawn from the distribution each time. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna uh, state this again. So from player I's perspective, the outcome of this mechanism looks to them like a T player position auction because I didn't use their bid information, I only used their rank information. So they're basically competing amongst the T minus one other bidders that came previously to be high ranked. Okay, and once I know your rank, this step two is gonna induce a probability of service for every rank you could have. Okay, those are your position weights. Okay, so it looks to a player like a position auction. Okay. You can ask how good is this position auction compared to the optimal welfare. And as you let T grow large, you would assume that you get arbitrarily close to the optimal welfare. Indeed, you do. And that rate that we, were, we proved in this paper is something like uh, root N over T. So uh, sorry, maybe I don't remember all the beginning. But this last theorem about the high welfare um, what do you assume of the type distribution? These values are... It's independent. But is this single dimensional or...? The players are single dimensional, yes. And it's just how much you allocate to them, if that's all. There's no... Okay. This is the standard single dimensional linear utility model of auction theory. So th these are results for any setting in that single dimensional linear model of auction theory. Okay, good, so I wanna answer some of these questions I've had about exactly what is the model which I'm using for previous rounds. So here, this is supposed to be informal. So suppose I had these samples, for example, here. Right now, let's try to make that more formal. Okay, so um, we're talking about the independent private value model. I have n bidders, uh, bidder i's values, is vi drawn from public distribution, fi. I wanna start by asking the question, when does this model make sense? Okay, does this model make sense if we're gonna run an auction once to sell billions of dollars of spectrum? No. Okay, in that model, uh, we're gonna have to, we probably are not gonna be imagining people are responding to priors that are come, like this. Okay, this model makes sense in mechanism setting, uh, uh, settings of mechanism design where there's a lot of uncertainty in what's going on. There's a lot of uncertainty in who you're gonna be competing with, um, which you, that's why you model uncertainty here. Uh, and you're, um, we're able to learn about this uncertainty you have maybe by repeated interactions in the, in the game or something. So something's happening a lot. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take the following uh, population interpretation of uh, the independent private value model, which is, which is this. So let's imagine I have for each bidder in the uh, stage game of the mechanism uh, a population. So I'll have n populations total. Uh, in each population, bidders have deterministic values, fixed values. 
Okay? Then what do I do when I run my mechanism? I independently draw a bidder from each population and run the mechanism on that population. Okay, the thing I really care about is when we're doing a lot of this, so we're going to actually repeat this uh, independently, maybe indefinitely. Okay, and I'd like to have good mechanisms for this iterative population model. Okay, so I think I've answered probably the questions about exactly what my model is. This is my model. Um, good. So in this iterative population model, with some feasibility constraint x, what am I going to do? Now making my mechanism more specific from the previous slide, I'm going to call it the, the ranking order statistic mechanism. So given my bids uh, in each iteration, I'm going to calculate the rank of bid i from t minus 1 previous calls to the mechanism of this bidder, which is independent draws from the same population. Okay, and then I'm going to allocate the surplus uh, to optimize the following thing, the surplus of expected order statistics uh, of the values given the ranks. Okay, so of each rank of a player, I know what the expected order statistic is of people from that population with that rank uh, for T draws. And I use those fixed numbers in my mechanism uh, to, to optimize in step two. As uh, Ben pointed out, uh, Have you assumed that the bidding behavior? I am not studying a dynamic situation in terms of bidding behavior. Uh, I'm assuming it's an equilibrium. I'm assuming that bidders bid in equilibrium for what's happening, which is this. Okay? So each, and in fact, uh, to look at what's happening, you have to figure out what each bidder thinks. So they get to play once, they never play again, basically. Imagine my population's a continuum. Okay, and they, uh, you know, to each, to them, it looks like they're drawn from a ID distribution and they're competing for these ranks. So it looks to them like a position auction. So that's the equilibrium is going to happen is the equilibrium of a position auction. Okay, um, oh, I have that here. So again, um, these players, the like player I is competing with these T minus one other players to be the one who's ranked uh, each rank, right? And so they compete in this position auction because each rank corresponds to an allocation probability in this downstream mechanism. Okay, and as I said before, it's this approximation. Yeah? In the behavior, you assume that in every period they know in which period they are, and they play Bayesian equilibrium given that information. It doesn't matter which period that they're in, the periods are all symmetric. But is there a start date? No. no. They're running forever. If you wish, you could imagine a ongoing mechanism that's where the where the fundamentals are very, very slowly evolving, much slower than T. Okay, so T, for instance, like how slowly things evolve in your population puts a bound on how big T can be. If you want, you can think of it that way. You sort of like expect naively that the rate would be square root instead of cube root. Is there a good reason? Yeah, so let me um, discuss the, uh, the proof a second. Um, so uh, if you restrict to values that are bounded between 0 and 1, okay, then you could analyze the additive loss of this mechanism. And in fact, uh, at a prior paper with uh, Bobby and Azarash, that you could interpret a theorem of that paper as actually proving this bound with uh, a square root. Okay. Now, the reason why we lose the square root and get the, the cubic uh, root uh, is to deal with the obstacles in going from a bounded range to the fact that there could be very rare people who have very high value. Okay. Now, the bad thing about rare people with very high value is when you look at their order statistics, they might not show up, they might not like, influence the order statistic very much. But when they do show up, you really want to serve them, and you might not be because their expected order statistic is low. Okay, so how do you address this? Um, well, people that show up very rarely but have very high value, fortunately, show up very rarely. So in fact, they never show up together, and no one notices they show up, so you can basically do whatever you want for these guys. Okay, and so balancing these terms of never showing up and doing whatever you want is going to introduce the, the cubic term.
Okay, any more questions on this? Sorry, I'm still confused. So it seems that in each round you're actually running a different mechanism because you're, you're because the map of your your rank uh, to the to the to the order statistics uh, is different according to the rounds. But somehow you are assuming they're playing in the same uh, equilibrium, GI. That so your first assumption was wrong. So in each round, I'm running the exact same mechanism. Um, but actually, another way to think about this that might help you is imagine instead of uh, for each player looking back T minus I rounds, instead let's batch in groups of T. So let's take T rounds of this mechanism, call it one mechanism. Instead of looking back, I also look I, for each player. I look basically over that interval of, of window T. Okay. And then you exactly get this position auction interpretation, and then observe the following. For each player i, there's no difference in looking back uh, t minus k and forward k, and just looking back t minus 1 in terms of what you do. It's an equivalent uh, probabilistic question to them. Yeah? So now it's basically a game. It's not just a game with the players who are simultaneous with you. It's a game in which you're playing with all the past players and future players as well, right? Because your uh, yep. what, what you get depends on that. So if the theorem says for any Bayesian Nash equilibrium of this big game that has this infinitely many players, this uh, you get this approximation. So the there, let's talk about uniqueness of equilibrium in first place position auctions. The theorem is that for each agent i, this looks like a position auction. Okay, you are not actually competing. Uh, it's like the problem they are solving is equivalent to a position auction. Okay, there's a stationary distribution of bids that you get in these auctions, and you're best responding to those bids. There's only one equilibrium there, so there's only one thing that happens. And actually, I would love to now talk about that. Okay, so how do you prove uniqueness of equilibrium in an auction? Uh, you show that there exists an equilibrium that you like, so the welfare optimal equilibrium exists. I'm going to skip that. That's standard. Um, the, then you show that among all symmetric equilibrium, there's only one, and that's also standard. Both of these use the uh, revenue equivalence theorem. Um, and then to show non-existence of asymmetric equilibrium, you could use a bunch of differential equations. What I'm going to do is show you the revenue equivalence proof of this result, um, that there are no asymmetric equilibrium using only revenue equivalence. To do that, I need to tell you revenue equivalence, which is starting from the standard Bayes Nash equilibrium characterization of Meyerson. The allocation rule from a player is a function of their value in equilibrium is xi, and it's a function uh, it increases in their value. And the payment they get is given by this formula. Let's understand the formula. Uh, so here's xi monotone increasing. This term vi xi just gives you a square of width vi height xi. This integral is the area underneath the curve. That's that. OK, and so the payment has to be the area above the curve. Good. For you guys, for this talk, all I care about is this. If you tell me the allocation, the utility is the area underneath the curve. Great. Um, this is known as revenue equivalence. In fact, the payment identity and revenue equivalence are basically the same thing, um, that auctions with the same allocation rule have the same revenue. So now I want to show non-existence of asymmetric equilibrium. Um, I'm going to restrict to just a single item auction here. The proof extension to uh, position auctions is, is almost no extra work. And this will simplify the notation. So we'll do that. Um, here's a first theorem you might want to show. Suppose I have two players in a first price auction uh, with a random uh, reserve that we don't know in advance, but we do know the distribution of it then this two-player auction has no asymmetric equilibrium. Okay? That is going to imply a corollary that in n-player first price auctions, there are no asymmetric equilibrium. Why is that? Well, player one and two face a random reserve given by the distribution of bids of players three through n. So players one and two have to have the same uh, symmetric equilibrium here by the theorem. OK, but then repeat the same argument for players 1 and i, so everyone's playing the same strategies. OK, so it suffices to prove this theorem. This is the theorem I'm going to prove on the next slide um, using revenue equivalence. 
Okay, so how do all revenue equivalence uh, proofs work? They work by using two equations for uh, the fundamentals, some of the fundamentals of the problem. I'm going to use utility. So two equations for the agent's utility. We have equation two, which comes from the revenue equivalence formula. This came from the previous slide, characterization of agent Ash equilibrium. It's the integral of the area underneath the allocation rule. But if it's a first price auction, I have another equation for a player's utility coming directly from the definition of the auction rules. So if they have value V and they bid S of V and they win with probability X of V, their utility is their value minus their bid times the probability they win. That's from a first price definition. Okay, now I have two um, equations for utility. I'm going to use those to get a contradiction in multiple equilibrium. Okay, so um, my proof is by contradiction, and I'm going to assume that strategies cross twice. If they cross zero times or one time, a variation of the exact same proof can argue that can't happen either. Okay, so we're just going to see one of the parts of the proof, which is when they cross twice. Okay, so here's my picture. I have value space here, and I've drawn the bids that bidders are making as a function of their uh, uh, values. And here's bidder one beating out bidder two over some interval where they cross twice. Okay, I'm trying to prove that can never happen. Okay, um, a claim I'm going to use as a sub, uh, a sub claim here, which I'm not going to actually show, but it's kind of obvious, is if at the same value, player one is bidding higher than player two, then player one is also winning with higher probability than player two in that equi equilibrium. It's kind of obvious. You have to write it down and be careful. Um, but, and I'm not going to do it. Let's just assume it. Okay? So I have these strategies that cross this point where player two, one is outbidding player two. So we conclude that um, uh, the allocation rule of player one is strictly bigger than the allocation rule of player two on this entire interval. Okay? Now, by equation two, one of my equations for utility, I can write down the difference in utility of player one for values on this interval. So the difference in utility from V prime to V, uh, v double prime to V prime is this area underneath the curve here. Okay? By the fact that x1 is strictly bigger than x2 on this interval, that is strictly bigger than the difference in player 2's utility. Okay, but now let's use claim 1 and equation 1, our second equation. So claim 1 says this inequality holds, but it's equal if they're equal. Okay, and so at the end points, V prime, V double prime, they're exactly crossing, and so their, their um, allocations are equal. So if their bids are equal and their allocations are equal, then by equation one, they have to have the exact same utility, which means their difference in utilities must be the same. Contradiction. Yeah. Like there's some continuity of strategies being imposed? In fact, I did assume that. I didn't say it out loud. It was on my previous slide. For this talk, I assume continuous strategies. In the paper, we do discontinuous ones. This is the main idea, though, and that you can see much more cleanly with continuous strategies. So where did you use the unknown reserve? The unknown, unknown reserve? That was on the previous, uh, where did I use it? And uh, claim one has to argue that something with this reserve. And I don't need to use the reserve. I just need to make sure it's robust to that. And claim one deals with that. Okay, inference. Before you go to inference, what is the broadest setting in which you can show uniqueness? Um, this is rank-based rules with payments based on your bid, not other things that are happening. Okay, so GSP, the second price payment rule, which where your payment is based on other people's bids, doesn't hold, uniqueness doesn't hold. And we know uh, uniqueness doesn't hold for second price rules. So in the actual auction, uh, so to understand the reduction to the position auction, so you do care about getting a higher position, but how much you care about that depends on the strategies of the other bidders that are playing with you, right? Higher, higher rank will give you yes. 
make me more likely to win, but that also depends. No, so I want you to remember that uh, once I compute these expected values, uh, every, the other, suppose you're player one, there's some other player two. Okay, so player two is uniform from all of their ranks. Always, well, and so. What if he uses the same strategy? What if he uses a different strategy? Because he won't be no, there. player two is always uniform amongst their bids, and therefore is uniform amongst the ranks. I assume that he uses the same strategy today as he was using yesterday? Yes. No, these are different bidders. So what I'm thinking about, what about equilibria, where players use different strategies and different so let's talk offline because I want to talk about inference. But that's not considered yeah. um, So there is no problem with that. Let's talk offline. Okay, let's talk about inference. Uh, so I want to talk about a very specific uh, three bidder example setting to talk about inference. So auction A is uh, selling one item to one of three bidders, auction B is selling two items to three bidders. Uh, and I'm going to consider auction C, which is mixing between A and B, which is going to sell one item and half an item, uh, and this looks like a position auction. Okay, the question I want to ask is, if suppose I've observed bids in C, can you estimate the revenues of A and B? So if I run one auction, can you estimate the revenues of another auction? And it turns out, if these auctions are all position auctions, this is a really simple task. Okay? Um, just to give you an overview of the results we're going to talk about, um, if you have n bid samples from bid C, you're doing an n position auction, and your auction B you ran with probability epsilon. Okay? Then I can estimate the bids of uh, the revenue of A and B directly from bids in C. Directly, I never infer values, so directly inferring revenue. Okay? My estimator is very simple, it's a weighted order statistic. What does that mean? I have some weights I've computed beforehand. I take my bids, I sort them, I take the weights, and I multiply them point-wise and sum them up, and that's my estimator. Okay, no complicated bandwidth functions or anything that you usually do if you're doing this um, kind of inference. My timer says four. <laughs> <laughs> So the revenue estimator is a weighted order. I mean, I can stop in one if you want. I'm just saying my timer says four. Okay. Do you want me to stop in one? Stop in three. <laughs> so um, this estimator for revenue B has uh, error. That's, uh, this is the, the, the bound we were able to prove for it. It's the standard square root of the number of samples you'd expect. And then you have some terms based on the number of players in the position auction. And most significantly, the dependence on epsilon, the probability that you actually ran B, is logarithmic in 1 over epsilon. And this should seem quite surprising because if you actually did an ideal controlled experiment where you sent epsilon traffic to A and got the bids in A, and 1 minus epsilon traffic to B and got the bids in B, and they just added those revenues up, then you'd have error, um, basically square root of 1 over epsilon. Right, because the number of samples you have is, is epsilon n. So the, the error would be square root of epsilon n. Okay? Um, so we get this bound. Um, let's see, I have one minute to tell you how this works. So this is the standard way you do econ econometric inference. So you, you basically solve for the bidder's values in terms of their bids, and you get this as the equation to convert uh, bids into values. And um, the big annoying thing here is you need an estimator for the derivative of bids. Okay, this is bids and derivative of bids and some allocation rules. Okay, you then plug in your values and solve for equilibrium and calculate revenues. This is the equation for revenue and auction given the values. Okay? If you do this by calculating values, you have to do all this stuff that gets really bad rates and stuff with uh, bandwidth functions to estimate derivative bids. So what we do is we actually just plug these equations together before we try to do anything. And then we have an integral with a derivative which we don't like. We integrate by parts to get rid of it. And we get a term that looks like this, some coefficient times the bid function, which is 
if you then look at it at even intervals of 1 over n, gives you a weighted order statistic. Okay, and so that's that. Okay, um, to conclude, ID position auctions, they're actually implicit in every independent private value model. Um, so therefore, uh, something worthy of very careful study. Um, and I showed you they have all these nice properties. Uh, and thank you. I still have one minute. <laughs> Thanks again.